What's going on, YouTube? This is the 10th episode of the Red Man Group Patriarchs Edition. I am Hunter Drew, and today we're going to be talking about how do you remain a high value man? So we're live, we're kicking this thing off, and we're going to get into topics that you know a lot of guys don't want to talk about, which is how you're resting on your laurels. All the guys talking about how they had great high school, you know, war stories. You were the top running back. You made all state 20 years ago. You're talking about how I was in the military. I was a go-getter. I squared away 30 years ago. Tonight, we're going to talk to a bunch of men who did great things in their past, but they continue to do so. Now, as we go through, we're going to talk about how do you remain a high value man, which is a man who continues to do things, a man who continues to push forward, to create stories, to do things that people are going to talk about tomorrow. You don't have to talk about something 30 years ago if you did something awesome last week. And that's what we're looking to do is men who aren't resting on their laurels, but they're going forward. Now, before we dive into the panel, before we dive deep into this, you know, we've got an awesome crew set up, but we're going to start out with the founder and the man who brought all of us together in the first place, Anthony Johnson. He's got quite a bit of news for us. So, Anthony, let's light that fire, man. Episode 10. This is the last oh. one before we go live. Take it. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. As a special guest, I'll be here just for a little bit of the show at the beginning here. I appreciate it. I'm not a father, but it's an honor to be on the show itself. As you mentioned, this is the last episode of the, uh, well, you know, temporarily before the event. It's coming up soon. So the 21 Convention Patriarch Edition is coming up in about two weeks, almost exactly. And so the next episode of this show will be filmed live in Orlando, Florida. We're going to have three, maybe four of them actually on Sunday, May 5th. Uh, so I'll be there. I'll be the whole film crew, the whole audience. Um, they'll probably be live on the internet. If not, though, they're going to be filmed like, you know, beautifully, all that stuff going on. And uh, that's the first event we've ever done for fathers. It's um, it's so close. I can almost taste it and feel it, you know, you can almost fucking smell it. And to see it come to fruition after so many years and over a decade of building the event and starting it for young guys, literally under 21, to see it come out to come together is like, it's beautiful, man. It's a lot going on. I'm working uh, night and day around the clock. The elves are just, you know, going around the shop, building shit, right? Getting books and hats and all that together. But I'm excited for that event to go on. Tickets are still on sale to the Patriarch event. They're going to be on sale for about another 10 days before they go offline. And those links, the link for that for Redman Group, support Redman Group, is in the link, uh, the description beneath this video. I'll put it in the chat too in a minute. And then also, of course, everyone probably just noticed, someone has bought actually from Redman Group. The tickets to the 21 convention of 2019 of Warsaw, Poland just went on sale. A couple days ago, we dropped a badass trailer on 21 Studios and Redman Group, uh, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. People have been going apeshit. It's easily the most triggering uh, video we've ever put out. <laughs> Um, but I think it does a good job too of encapsulating like what I want to put together for that event. Um, I get a lot of heat from you know being negative with stuff like that or edgy, but really behind that edge, like a blade, is like a whole um, the meat and potatoes, which is you guys. You guys put out endless amounts of positive educational content on this show and in speeches and everything you guys do. And I'm happy that I can use video production and an entire event in Warsaw to put that together and make it a very strong edge for Europe. I call I'm calling it uh, Europe's ultimate event for men, which it is. It's our fourth time we're going back to Poland, or excuse me, not Poland, but Europe. First time in Poland. And I can't wait to go back myself. I was there recently in Poland for about a week and a half. It was an amazing experience preparing for the convention we're doing there in July. Tickets, by the way, are on sale, like I said, and the event dates, <clears throat> excuse me, are July 18th to 21st, 2019. So it's a full 21 convention experience. Uh, Hunter, you won't be there yourself, but I'll be there. Drew Bay might be there. Rolo Tomasi will be there. Cobra Tate. Uh, Richard Grannon, uh, Krauser, uh, PUA, highly recommended by Rolo, AJ Cortez, Goldman Unleashed. A lot of our alumni speakers will be there and new speakers alike. So I'm fucking stoked for that. I'm in love with Poland. Uh, so much going on this year. It's wild, man. It's super exciting. And I'm doing Patriarch and then Poland right after. It's just, you know, a lot popping off. But everyone should get tickets. Uh, there's also, I should mention too, there's discounts for all of our events. So Patriarch, Poland, and then also this year when the Atlanta tickets launch. So everybody who's military, law enforcement, firefighter, or under 25, they can get a 25% off discount. If they want that, all they got to do is visit the webpage and they'll see instructions for how to do that. And I'm happy to extend that to all guys so uh, for that ca those categories, active or retired military, active or retired law enforcement, same thing with firefighters and young guys too, under 25. So that's what's going on. We're bringing the, uh, the gender war to Europe, bringing the gender war to Poland in a very positive sense and finish the fight. And uh, happy to you know get that going. In addition to the patriarchs, that's a, that's about to pop off as well. You know, I was pretty bummed, man. So the reason I'm not going, for those who don't know, is the fraternity of excellence, which I'm part of, is having our first official get together the same exact weekend, and I had to be there at that. 
But I'm like, when you went to Poland and you were talking about how you saw all the families and there were just the oh, yeah. women, you know, very feminine and the men were masculine, yeah. like just it made sense. I was like, man, that'd be the perfect venue for me to drop some like some family alpha, some like yeah. straight up patriarchy on their asses. So Dude, I'll it, be there in it, spirit, man. I'll be cheering everybody on, but I'll oh, be in Colorado okay. with my FOE brothers. I thought about moving the whole event for you, but I'm like, I just don't know. You're still gonna be super busy with what you have going on. And I'm like, it's it's okay. You're already speaking at two events this year and leading one of them. So it's like, you know, how much are you gonna do? Like, holy shit. Yeah. Plus you're doing the show constantly. <laughs> uh, but you bring up good. you bring up a really good point. Like I heard a lot of good things about Eastern Europe and stuff like that. And I've been all around the world. I've been to like 25 countries and Poland just blew me away. They're so pro family, they're so pro man, they're so pro woman. Uh, women there want to act like women, men act like men. There's just babies and kids everywhere. It's just crazy. The kids are super well behaved too. Like I've never seen anything like it in my life anywhere else in Europe, in America, Canada, Australia, Indonesia, like none of that, South America, none of that shit. Poland was um, just mind blowing, man, in like 10 different ways, a thousand different ways. I can't wait to go back. I'm planning to spend like a month there myself. So before the event, during the event, and then I'm just going to travel around the countryside or something like that uh, after the event, just drive around. It, it was heavenly, man. For for the kind of red pill, I call it a red pill candy land. But really, if you compare it to America, America is just like this toxic hellhole of a lot of bad ideas, man. Like I love my country and I love you know what we the history of what we've done. But right now, in terms of the sexual marketplace and the dating marketplace and gender relations, it's like a shit show, man. And it's bad enough that you see that around you and you feel that and you want to respond to that. When you go to a place that doesn't have that shit, that has 80% less feminism and all this crap, uh, it's it's beautiful, man. You, it's like a whole, um, it's refreshing to, as, a, as an understatement. On it. It's like rejuvenating your soul. So I can't yeah, wait to I, go back. I view it as, you know, we're in rough waters and we're on a ship. And yeah. you, see, you see something like Poland and you're like, man, that's that's a harbor America could pull into. That, that, is, exactly, that is something that is, we could go yeah. to. Yep, that is exactly what it's like. Like they they love America too in Poland, and the same way I love them, I think. But we have a lot to learn from them, and we really need to import a lot of Polish culture and the fundamentals that they have. It's healthier than anywhere I've ever seen in my life. And I hear a lot of Eastern European countries are like this in terms of how men and women interact, get along, build families, make babies, relationships, everything like that. Uh, it was it was incredible, man. I I really hit the nail on the head picking the event or the location. So, so were the uh, Poland girls friendly ports, friendly harbors. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you got to have game. Like they, I've seen some guys bitch about, uh, trying to bang girls there and I understand why, like, if you don't have your shit together, they're not going to fuck you. But if you do, uh, you have a much better chance that, you know, it's, it's going to be good. The woman that basically, if you're a man and you're masculine and you have this weak beta cuck, like soy boy, you're going to do pretty well if you want. Uh, I'm going to go drive around see if I can find a baby mama, pick some chick up and make her wife. <laughs> Uh, Next I'm, patriarch will yeah. be a patriarch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm half serious, but I'm not. I'm not entirely joking. Like this is a country that's like, if you want to go the route of, of importing a wife to America to build a family with, Poland's an excellent option. That has its own risks and you know uh, risk management you got to do with that and the complications. But dude, I would. It's I. It's hard to imagine at this point building a family with an American chick knowing what's available in Eastern Europe. Like you think you could just pick the top 10% in America or something like that, but that has its own problems. And do women in Poland just walking around like average, the average chick is just amazing. Sweet feminine girl, uh, as far as I know, has not been slutting it up like girls in America on Tinder. You still got to watch out. Women are women, right? They can go, they can flap the handle in a heartbeat. But these women are like happy to be women. They're, they're happy to be around the men. Uh, it, it, I mean, I saw one cat lady when I was there the whole time. One. And her boyfriend was like a total beta. And that was this was like the total exception to the rule that like men are men, women are women, they get along, there's not a lot of riffraff, you know, shit like that. And this is like A to Z, man. This is like at coffee shops, this is in like these hardcore clubs, like anywhere you go. It's just uh, a lot healthier relationship between men and women. It's not perfect, I'm sure, but it's just like, it was, it was incredible. I, I can't wait to do the convention now. We're gonna do it again and we're gonna do it repeatedly in Poland for sure, 100%. I, I I already said it, man. My flag's planted. I will be at the next one. Yeah, we'll right, make so. that one work oh, yeah. out. Yeah, me too. Me too. I can't. I can't. I can't go this time either. Not <laughs> so, yeah. I think that whole topic, though, and that whole lead-in, you know, segues very well to what we're about to do. You know, here tonight, so we've got an hour plus to talk about how, when you're in that relationship, you don't turn into that guy. You don't become the man who is no longer leading, or the man who no longer is interesting, or that's captivating the woman who's with you. You know, you did a lot of things to get that woman. Now, once you get her, you know, we never get the girl, right? You know, you, you continue to do that going forward. 
And like I said, we've got an awesome panel. So Anthony, thank you. You know, for everybody, the link is below. If you want tickets, definitely get them now. You know, now is the best time. We got the early bird discount. Tickets are not going to be cheaper than that. So dive on it, get it early, secure your spot, set it up. I mean, it's going to be amazing. It's one of those things where, and, and text can vouch for this. Once you see it happening, you're going to be like, I wish I went. Yep. You know, it was two years ago. Tex was, he was on, like, should I go? Should I not go? And then we went and he's like, damn it. <laughs> yep. so, I love hyping your guys' expectations up because I always blow them away. So it's kind of like I set you guys up and then it's crush it anyway. So, well, I'm, I'm going yeah. to pimp, pimp it a little harder. I, I, I've been in sales and marketing stuff uh, for 30 something years now. I have been to a number of events over the years, man, conferences, conventions, uh, big giant business meetings with, you know, 1,000, 1,500 people from the company there, that kind of thing. And work for a company that's 85,000 employees. So, I mean, we, we, I have been to all of this shit. Last year in October, I was stunned at how well this damn thing was put together. It was, everything was on time, everything rolled, everything. I mean, things were just tight the entire way. The production quality was excellent. The lighting was excellent. The film crew was excellent. I mean, the, the, the volunteers had their act together. I mean, it, this was, you know, one thing you couldn't do, you weren't going to get to talk to Anthony much because the man's possessed running around making sure everything's going to work <laughs> on time. And that's okay, right? That's some, you know, he's not here to socialize, here to work. And uh, so I, I was just extremely impressed with the whole damn thing, and I won't miss another one. Thanks, Tex. Appreciate it. That was good. Uh, I'll let you patriarchs hit, hit the road here, hit the show. Take I care, will, brother. Uh, respectfully bow. Thank you, guys. Elliot, Drew, all you guys. Peace out. I'll be cheering and cheerleading from the sideline here. <laughs> there we go. All right. So diving into the panel for tonight's discussion, we've got uh, faces that everybody recognizes. Somebody in the chat's already yelling, yo, Elliot. So we're going to start it out. We've got Drew Bay from Bay.com. We've got Elliot Holes from ElliotHoles.co. And we've got Tex from TexasDom.com. So, Drew, start out with you. What's up, man? What's new? Same as the last couple of times. Still uh, trying to wrap up some books and just excited for the 21 Convention Patriarch Edition. Just, uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I, I loved the last two events. You know, I've been at the 21 Convention almost every single one since, oh, man, I think 2009. The last two just absolutely blew everything else away. And so I'm I'm just thrilled, thrilled for this one. Look forward to seeing all the men there. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, I'm not doing a whole lot other than uh, the books and, and prepping for that, though. I dig it. Elliot, how you doing? I think this is the first time we are you this is your first Patriarchs RMG. I know you've been a red man, but I think this is the oh, first yeah. Patriarchs red man. Yes, sir. It is my first time. Happy to have you. Yeah, man. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. And I'm pretty excited to be a part of the Patriarch event. You know, being a father of four children, being a father figure to millions of men worldwide. Uh, it's a perfect fit. And then to be side by side with great men like you guys uh, who are doing wonderful work in the world and spreading this message of strong masculinity. The time is right. And we're leading the charge. Dude, so when I flew down to Florida, we recorded uh, Sons of Patriarchy. We got to shoot and everything. And it was like, you know, it's the first time. Like, all right, we're going down. We're going to make this. You know, it's going to be an awesome movie. It's going to be an awesome event. And then we're sitting there. And those guys, you know, straight up humbled us. It's amazing that when you take guys, and, and, and like you said, you're like, oh, a bunch of masculine dudes. We're all motivated. But when you're not in your element, when you're out there and you're letting, like, the other expert teach you, you know, it's like totally look around. You're like, Anthony's learning and sock and you and I, we're all like, we don't know what we're doing. And these guys are teaching us like, here's how you hold the gun. And here's how you turn the corner. And we're all humbled. But there were no arguments. Everybody came together. The beauty of the patriarchs is it's not just the speakers, but it's also all those who attend. We do the same thing. We all learn from one another. And then the guy who's good at this teaches the other guy and he gets stronger. And as a whole well-rounded you know, group, it's like we become one organism. So those, the crowd and those speaking, we all just kind of converge. And it's just like everybody going out. It's just better because of it. So it's fucking awesome, man. I'm really happy to have you, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, amazing. Me too. Thank you. Tex, what's new, brother? What is new? Um, I thought I was going to have a book ready to go uh, in two weeks for this uh, event coming up, but unfortunately, my wife's been rather sick for the last couple of uh, – last month or so. But she's getting a lot better, and we're, we're, we're really on an upward tick, and things are going extremely well. So – I've gotten delayed on that project, but looking forward to finishing it up sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to this thing with the fatherhood thing, the patriarchy thing, and it's not just fatherhood. It's just, you know, how do you manage your family, your extended family? I mean, I've got grandkids. 
I've got an ex-son-in-law. I've got a, a daughter. I've got a son. Um, you know, I, there, there's a lot of things that go on and play here. Um, and then the older you get, the bigger your family gets and the more your responsibilities as a leader of that family get. And uh, you have to make some tough choices sometimes. And so we'll be talking about a lot of that in a couple of weeks in May. But uh, thrilled to be here. Thrilled to still be a dad. Even more thrilled to be a granddad. Those, you guys that have kids, man, I'm telling you, when, when those grandkids are born, your kids are just gone, man. They, they, they just don't even hit the top five anymore. It's, it's all about the grandkids. <laughs> And the, and the kids, are, and I would told my kids, so I love you, but I, I will pick the grandkids over you any day of the week. You know, <laughs> shut them down. Right? Kids, for them. Well, they don't want to hear it, right? But it's the truth, man. It's the best part. Of, it's the best part of getting older. I uh, wish I had more kids now. So life is good. We talk about the patriarchy. We talk about, you know, 21 con patriarchs. We're getting all pumped up. You know, we're hyping it up. And all these guys like, yeah, fatherhood. Yeah, everything's coming together. When you really step back, you know, who has more skin in the game than a man who's reproduced and created flesh? And that ball of flesh is now growing up in society. Yeah, I don't know any men who have a greater calling to make this thing better than them. I have nothing against the MGTOW community or the Playboys. Do what you got to do. You're a man. You own it. You own the consequences of the choices you make for good or bad. That's yours. For the men who've had kids, though, there's, a, there's an incentive to perform. There's a reason for you to do what it is you do, a reason for you to raise this standard, because you are trying to make society as a whole better. Now, people want to say it's about the man, screw society. That doesn't happen when you have a kid because your kid's growing up in that, that environment. So if your kid's growing up in a harsh environment, your kid's going to be facing things that you might not have faced as a kid. But as a red pill aware man, as a man who is just expressing his authentic nature, as an individual who is choosing to live on your terms as opposed to being the man society's told you to be, you're allowed to instill those values and that foundation in your kids. They're going to get blasted you know, through, through media. They're going to get blasted through school, their teachers. You've got to build a strong foundation in that individual that when they come up, they're also standing back, you know, shoulders back, squared away, looking at them and like, no, I'm not going to change to be the man you want me to be. I'm going to be who I want to be, sons or daughters. And one of the best ways you can do that is by remaining an, an authentic individual as you go forward through life. Now, I, talk, I spoke about earlier, the topic is how do you remain a high value man? It's not just about maintaining high value man with your fashion, your fitness and everything. It's, it's who you are to your core as someone who's doing something. We talk about all these guys who are still talking about high school. You can't be that as a father. You know, your kid's going to grow up and be like, my dad used to be a good guy. My dad used to be fit. My dad used to be, you know, squared away. And now he's just a fat schlub who's talking about how he used to be awesome. So tonight we're going to talk about, hey, how do we all continue to maintain that going forward? And each, each man here has his story. So I'm looking forward to hearing those. And I, I told the, the gents before we even kick this off, this is about actionable advice. Every Patriarchs episode, I don't want to talk to you strictly about theory and how things might work. Let's talk about how things can work and how you can apply it so you're not that dad who is sitting there saying, I scored five touchdowns in a, in a high school football game like Al Bundy. You've got to be better than working at the shoe store talking about high school, okay? So with that, I'm going to throw it to you. Somebody can run with it. But how do you keep yourself from becoming a man that's talking about high school victories or that man who used to be in the military and is talking about old war stories? How do, how do you become the man who's talking about things he's done today or this month or going to do? I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead, Drew. Nope. I was going to say, I think uh, you have to have a mission. And that mission has to be to build something that is bigger than you. It has to be something that isn't, doesn't have a defined endpoint, but is rather a continuous process because it leaves room to continually grow and improve yourself. My mission is to help as many people as possible to exercise more sanely, more mindfully. Um, that's something that obviously there's no ending to. To be able to effectively do that, to reach more and more people, I have to continuously improve myself in my understanding of the subject that I teach, my ability to effectively teach it, to communicate it to others. And most importantly, and this has taken me a little bit of time to get back to, to set an example. If I have a mission that requires continual improvement, I have motivation to constantly work on making myself better to be able to further that mission. I think if you, uh, it's like, well, making yourself your mental point of origin. If once you get to the point, you know, you get your wife, you get your kids, and you're just kind of coasting along and all the things that you've done previously, it's like, yeah, you know, if you gun the car down the road and then, 
you just lay off the gas. You're only going to coast so far before you grind to a to a halt. And when you do that, when you stop moving forward, I think there were, everything else kind of falls apart. Uh, Hunter was talking about how oh, you can't. Uh, your kids think, well, oh, dad used to be this, used to be that. They weren't there. They don't see who you were in high school, who you were in college, who you were in the military or any of that. All they see is who dad is now. That is the example that they have to follow. Your wife, I, actually, it depends. You know, some people, I know some guys who married their the girl that they were dating in grade school. But for most of us, we met our wives after high school or college or the military. She might hear the stories, but that's doesn't even matter. I mean, we all know guys who were hot studs when they got married. Their wife knew who they were, but they let themselves go. And so things fell apart. You cannot coast on, no matter how fast you went to start out, once you lay off the gas, you're going to slow down. You can only coast so far. You're better off just keeping the pedal to the metal and moving forward. If you don't maintain yourself, you don't really show your kids. You can't tell them who you were. You got to show them who you are and who they can be. Same with the wife. Doesn't matter if you were, you know, hot stud when she got married. You let yourself get fat and sloppy. You know, she's she's got her plan B and plan C guy that she's thinking about when she's doing her duty sex for you. That's not what you want. You want the enthusiastic uh, validation sex, not the oh, let's get it over with stuff. The dead fish, starfish laying there, the drip yeah. feed. So I'm going to throw it in the hot spot for a second. So the other two gents, I know where they were and where they are. But for you, you, you've always been like a jack stud. <laughs> like, did you Not ever always. find yourself going through a transition? I don't think I know your history well enough, but was there ever a point where you're like, you were this and then you, you, you slipped and you had to reinvent? Absolutely. Um, I was the prototypical skinny guy who beefed up. And in college, I did bodybuilding. I was doing modeling and was, you know, in phenomenal condition pretty much all the time. Moved down to Florida, stayed that way for a while and just, you know, kind of coasted on it. Uh, after getting married, though, I made the mistake that I have recently been warning so many other people against, and that was to, you know, get comfortable and get sloppy. And after all, I got downright embarrassingly fat. Now, not to the point where you look at me and think you I was obese or anything, but to me, not having abs is being fat. And so it was very uncomfortable. And I also got frustrated with it because I know way more about this topic, about exercise specifically now, than I did 20 something years ago. I'm better at teaching it. I'm better at explaining it. And I've had a lot of experience since then training and helping other people. But they don't see that when they look at the fat, doughy, pale guy. In college, I had people coming up to me all the time asking for advice on training because of the way that I looked. They had no idea who the hell I was. Now, or actually not now, but at, at, when I got to that point where I had let myself go badly enough, I realized that it didn't help my mission. It didn't matter how much I could help other people if I could not basically be a demonstration if I was not walking the walk. So I don't know what happened, but at some point, and actually, I think it was actually right around the time of the, the 2017 convention. I remember sitting there listening to Jack Donovan and listening to Eric Van Sydow talk. And it was like, it was like having a, not just a fire lit under my ass, but jet fuel poured on top of it and thinking, you know what, I do not, I don't deserve to be speaking at these conventions if I am not doing this stuff myself and setting the kind of example that I need to. And even more so, you know, I want to be as attractive as I can for my wife. I want my son to look at me and be inspired to be better himself. And I've seen, I'll give you some examples. I've got uh, my youngest brother, David, he's a competitive bodybuilder, uh, Mr. Wisconsin in 2013 and 2018. He's competed nationally a bunch of times. 
just massive, ripped guy. And when he goes out, and when we've been out together, when I'm back home visiting, sometimes we'll be in public places and you'll see these kids pointing at him and looking at him. And he's he overshadows me by a, a long shot. And they're like, oh, daddy, daddy, mommy, look at that guy. Look at that guy. And sometimes you can see the look in the dad's faces and you and you notice the looks in the mom's faces too. <laughs> and the, the kid is looking at my brother like, and the dad is just some fat schlub. And he knows that he's being compared to that. Not everybody's going to, to be a bodybuilder, but every single person can be, I think most people, the, the majority of people would be shocked at how much they can improve their bodies if they eat well and if they train hard. And if they do that, they could, well, who, who did most of us look at growing up as idols, uh, as men? You know, the action heroes, uh, I'm dating myself here, but back in the 80s, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, a lot of us probably read comic books and looked, and how do the heroes, how, well, how were they drawn back then? Lean, muscular, powerful men. That is what, thank you, that is what the kids are looking at and idolizing, but then if they look at their dad, and their dad is some fat, sloppy dude. It's kind of like, that's that's my dad. You don't want them to look at you and be like, that's my dad. You want to look at me, that's my dad. And they don't do that unless you are your best. I've still got a ways to go. I'm not, I'm not close to where I want to be yet. I will never be because I'm going to continue to improve. But I wouldn't if I didn't reset my mental point of origin on myself and have that mission to continue to move me forward. The mission is the brick on the gas pedal that keeps everything going fast without losing momentum. We have to take a moment to recognize that your lady came in, gave you a drink and picked up kettlebells on her way out. <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm pretty I'm sure not... she's like cleaning as she goes out. I don't know what she grabbed. I think she took a bunch of the dog toys. No, oh, I thought it was like little kettlebells just laying around. <laughs> Those <laughs> dogs are so tough. They have fucking kettlebells. They're jacked too. No, yeah. hey, I dig it. And that's that's an excellent point for, for everybody that's listening to understand that it's cool you went through these things. But again, complacency wow. sets in. Familiarity breeds complacency. I was so fat. I mean, for, for me, it was embarrassing. But it was fuel. It was fuel to, to start working to get back where I should be. Now, one of the reasons I'm really pumped to have Elliot on is when I first started following him, I think it was Strongman Elliot, you know, in the, the warehouse garage. And then it turned to, you know, I didn't even know about football Elliot. And then it became Strength Camp Elliot. So you're continually progressing. And a lot of guys, and there, there are a lot of men who also, you know, played college football. Also, you know, maybe they were, you know, just under NFL, going towards NFL. They were in that. And then something slipped. And now they're car salesmen. Now they're just the average nine to five, but they're always, they're still talking. Hey, I used, I once played college football. Yeah, but you're not that guy anymore. So Elliot, how were you able to continually reinvent and raise that standard and start shifting things? Well, it's something my father used to say to me that I don't care what you do, just be the best. And so for me, it really doesn't matter whether it's football, whether it's strongman, whether it's dominating YouTube, whether it's being a great father or husband or the best mentor I can be, building outer strength, inner strength. These days I've been working on my aesthetics and my ascetics through fasting. So whenever I do something, I'm not just doing it to do it. I'm doing it to win. And so I think that's the difference. A lot of people are kind of just like drifting through life kind of smelling the roses but i'm <laughs> i'm driving through that bitch with a pickup truck <laughs> trying to take the trophies and everybody else's toys home now does your wife see or do your wife and kids do they ever look at your youtube or do they see you at strength camp or do you do that solo and then they're you know at home and then they meet you up after uh, yeah, I mean, my children have seen my YouTube videos. My wife is actually sitting right across from me. I mean, it's very much integrated into who I am and what I do. I work from home these days, so my children are very aware. Plus, all their friends at school. In fact, like my daughter asked my son, who's eight years old today, uh, <laughs> Benjamin, are you popular at school? It's just like a dumb question she's asking. And, she, and he goes, 
yeah and and so my daughter was like why and he says uh because my dad's a famous youtuber <laughs> so <laughs> so you know they all kind of and then my oldest daughter you know it's kind of tough because she wants to date boys and all the boys know me and uh, i'm sure there's an intimidation factor there so uh yeah they Good. don't they can't get away from the fact that you know, their dad's a badass <laughs> they roll in nice to meet you sir i had fasted for 48 hours prior to seeing you and i just deadlifted 550 pounds nice to <laughs> shake hands <laughs> mm -hmm. yep it's excellent the reason i bring that up is a lot of men they'll kill it at work and they think that that's enough you know they're they, they're absolute studs at the nine to five but when they come home their family never sees that so even though they, they are still currently a, a total like kicking ass, like you said, in the truck grabbing trophies, you know, at, at the stock market, at their business, at whatever it is that they do, you know, when they come home, they're like, oh, I kicked ass today. I'm going to now change into my gym shorts and my t-shirt. I'm going to relax because I, I went total beast mode. The issue is their family never saw that. So you, you're in a situation where, you know, your lady's with you right now. She gets to see you engaging and doing these things with men because that's her man. That's what men do. But if you're the man who's killing it at the office and you come home and you're just relaxing, all your family sees is relaxed you. You need to be intentional with that. If you're in a situation, for me, I, I have the normal nine to five. When I come home, I've got to continue to, to do shit that's awesome. So mm -hmm. between coaching and between the stuff I do here, you know, that's that's how I bring it to my family. They get to see me doing things. But if I were to not be intentional about that, they would never know. No, and they don't care. And they take for granted, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it just seems like we have stuff. So it's not like they're uh, they're cheering you on for making more because you're working harder. They just become more and more spoiled. <laughs> you're, not, you're never there. That's that's a good thing no, though, about like uh, Drew was saying, like you're never satisfied. Like if, as long as you're always hungry, they're just like, they just expect it. Like that's just you. Now you compare right. yourself to other guys and you're like, yeah, I'm kicking ass. But for them, they're like, that's just what you do. Like, right. are you kidding me? I think when I told Jackie, I was like, hey, I hit 20,000 followers on Twitter. She's like, neat. Do you get a trophy? Like, she didn't give a fuck. <laughs> no, and I'm no, like, no. all right, well, there's that. <laughs> Move forward. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Now, so I had, a, uh, I had a great yeah. object lesson um, when I was growing up. My dad played over we're in the football things. My dad played college football at Rice back when they were actually winning national championships. And uh, I found his old jersey from the East West All Star Game, Collegiate All Star Game. And I never knew he played football the entire time. I, mean, I was like maybe nine or 10 years old, right? And I still have that freaking jersey locked away somewhere right now. Um, dad had all kinds of things that he did. I mean, he was a legitimate hero guy. He had saved a kid, a girl in high school, was written up. It's just all these things that he did in the scrapbook that my grandmother put together. And uh, he, he never, he never threw all that stuff out. So that was object lesson uh, that I grew up with, knowing that as a dad, you know, you just don't live in the past for your kids and brag about that shit. And then I also had the benefit. I went to my five year high school reunion in '84. And I'm sitting around, you know, some of us played uh, the high school football player guys. Some played college, some of us did, and that kind of thing, right? But they were all talking glory days, even just five years out, right? And so the interesting thing was um, the uh, excuse me, tenure. Even, I'm sorry, tenure. Even, um, Springsteen had just come out with that song, Glory Days. And I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan back in the day. And so I heard that song and I always thought about that song and I go to the reunions and stuff and I see the people still doing it and all that. And it was just one of those lessons early on in my life. I thought, you know, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to be that guy. He, he never listened to the Springsteen song, obviously. So you just don't brag about shit you did in the past because nobody cares. You know, <laughs> you just don't give a crap. You know, your, your kids certainly don't. Yeah. So I threw Drew in the hot spot and Tex, it's your turn. A lot of these guys, they see Redman Group Tex, you know, the FOE guys, they see the fasting Tex, you know, you're teaching them all these things. A lot of guys don't know where you came from. You know, you, you weren't always the stud that people are seeing on here that are just like getting after it and the Dom and, you know, doing all these things. You know, you were there. There is a past and you could have stayed there, but you chose not to. And you shared. I'm not talking about the origin story, but you, you made a, a conscious decision to no longer be that guy. And I've seen the photos, man, and you have come a distance. But a lot of people don't know how far you've come. So for those who think that you've always been this way, you want to no. lay a little bit on them, um, a little history? Yeah, I'll, 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 th I'll throw some honesty out here, and you guys can judge me all you want. Uh, I went from that guy that 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 played ball, the guy that was in shape. I was bartender, bouncer. I'm doing my origin story, sorry. But bartender, bouncer, you know, all that kind of shit, bodyguard and all that stuff when I was younger. 
I got married. I got fat. I got lazy. I mean, I got real fucking fat, like 330 pounds fat. Okay. Um, you know, and, and you suffer from that after you lose fat again, because then you got shit hanging everywhere and it's never going to go away, but this is what it is. But I, I had got to a point in my life and just, you guys have heard this before. And I'll keep it brief. Um, I, I pretty much figured divorce was imminent and I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought you were never going to get a date the rest of your life. if You don't do something about this. And so honestly, it was a powerful motivator. My wife didn't let me no more. It felt like, you know, and I was tired of this fucking starship. You know, starfish sex once a month, maybe, if I'm lucky, kind of shit. Like, fuck this. I'm just doing something about it. And honestly, guys, it's the goofiest thing of all. With old Tony Tony Horton and P90X, baby. I got a set of P90X disc, and I sat there in my living room, and I fucking did it. And I bought some <laughs> dumbbells, and I just fucking did it. I hated it. I fucking hated plyo day. I hated all this stuff. But I love yoga day. Don't get me wrong. Yoga, fucking Tony's version of yoga is an ass kit, man. I mean, it'll, it'll, whoop, it'll whoop your butt. But all of a sudden, the wife started seeing that. She made fun of it. She called him gay Tony and all these things. But, but she saw me doing it. It irritated the hell out of her, right? But then she started improving her game as well. So uh, that's just kind of how we got we got started and how I got to where I'm now in decent shape. But I got so much further to go. You know, I'm work in progress right now. Well, and, and there, there is a method to the madness. And the reason I brought that up is not just for you to share your story, but for the guys yeah. that are listening to this that are in that situation. Like, look, I... I just got to start doing something, you know, and for a lot of guys that that's simply like just start doing something for you, which brings to the next topic that I want to throw out to all of you, which is, do you think that you have an issue? A lot of the men are facing when it comes to maintaining that, that sense of value and that sense of, you know, creating who you are and maintaining that, that, that drive to go forward is that they're afraid to make anything a priority for themselves that is higher than their family. They're afraid to do something where they, they have to leave their wife. I'm like, hey, wife, sorry, I can't hang out tonight to watch Netflix and drink a box of wine. I've got to go do the to the gym or to the, the meeting with the guys or whatever it is they want to do. You know, do you find that men are afraid to invest in themselves or make themselves a higher priority because they've been taught to self-sacrifice in all situations ever? Absolutely. I mean, I guess who puts that in, in your head? Your wife, your wife's friends, your mom. I mean, all these people, all these women in your lives are like, you know, that's what a good man does. He sacrifices. Look at that man. He, you know, he is, he is sacrificing working two jobs to, to give his kids the very best and the nicest house and this, that, and the other. And you just think all your life that you're just supposed to become a plow mule, you know, and then that's, that's just, that's just not it. You, know, you, you, you got to invest in yourself. And if you, here's the thing, right? This, I hate this fucking line. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. I got a better one, right? If daddy ain't happy, he's an idiot because he needs to take care of himself first. He needs to start becoming happy because, man, rising tide lifts all boats, right? And if I'm happy and I'm feeling good about my job, my life, my sex, you know, how I look in the mirror, things like that, my confidence is sky high. I'm fun to be around. My kids benefit from that. My wife benefits. Everybody around me benefits. So you got you got to invest. What's funny is Rolo, he might hop on. You know, he said he may be available. We we're going to have Ryan Mickler. Baseball came up. Guess what? He's out there coaching his son's baseball team right now instead of being on here. Obviously, that is the better priority. Higher prioritized. I coach my son's team as well. Guess what? My wife would love for us to come home early to do something. No, we got to practice. We got to go out with the team. So we'll go out there for hours. And when the other kids go home, we have the key to the lights. So we go, turn the light on, and we stay another hour because that's what they need. And the other boys, they'll stay. And all of a sudden the dads stay and all of a sudden, you know, you're building this whole camaraderie and you're leading this whole tribe, you know, without even trying, you're just to you, you're just being a man and doing your thing. But if you are afraid that your wife's going to get mad, that you're going to come home to a cold dinner, or you're not going to come home in time for her show, you know, you would never have done that. And by not doing that, your son would not have seen you do that. He would not have gotten as, as good at the sport or whatever it is he's doing because he was not given the opportunity for the extra reps. The other boys would not have seen it. The other dads would not have seen it. The ripple effect goes beyond anything we are aware of it, it's absolutely insane you have to maintain your hobbies and your other pursuits outside of marriage uh, maybe not outside of marriage is maybe not the best way to put it but if you are playing a sport if you're coaching if you like i i perform with local musicians periodically um you got to be able to just go and do the things that you want to do without you've probably heard people say, well, I gotta, I gotta check with my wife first. We might have plans. There might be a thing going, no, do you want to do it? 
then you should not have to ask permission, especially things that are important to you. In fact, if your wife does love and respect you, then she would not serious. Now she might shit test, but she would not seriously expect or want you to give up things that matter to you. Or if you do give, here's the thing. If you do give up those things, she's going to, she's going to lose respect for you for doing that. So it's, it's a, you're going to lose either way. If you do just keep doing the things that you love, the things that you care about, whether or not that means taking some time away from the family, as long as you are not completely neglecting them. Obviously, you know, you need to be a father, you need to be a husband, but not at the expense of being you. I'm glad you put, so Ryan calls it the don't eat lead paint, you know, disclaimer. Let's put that out there right now. Unless you're on the spectrum and you're fully like taking this shit to the extreme, we're not saying go out and never be at home or be a present in, a masculine presence in your child's lives, or your wife's life. You need to be home to lead. It doesn't mean disappear for three weeks at a time to do whatever you want. Like, hey, hey, bitch, I'm going to do my own thing. You know, like, obviously, let's use some common sense. And the fact that we have to say that shows how far some people take these things. So look, you have to understand how to balance this. It's all there's a, a moderation to it. You don't just disappear for six weeks and you have a family. Mm -hmm. Now with that, I think, and uh, Elliot, I want to talk to you about this with all the things you have going on. You know, my wife, she, she kind of views it. There's like a sense of pride, like, oh, the boys are out at the field. And she says it to my daughter. So she's kind of teaching her like, yeah, that's what the boys, they go out and they do their thing. While they're gone, we're also going to do our thing. So when we come home, you know, my son and I, we have our stories. Yeah, we, we hit this. We ran these drills, all these things. But also when it's just me and I'm going out on my own and I'm not leading the sun, which is a little easier for her to take, you know, let's say uh, for patriarchs, I'm not bringing my wife. I'm going down solo. Of course, she doesn't want me gone for a week, but I have to do that thing. You know, when you, you know, th there are moments, there are times in your kids' lives, I'm sure your wife's lives where they're like, do you have to go do this thing? You know, sometimes you have to say yes, even though you want to stay home. So for the guys that are struggling with that, you know, decision to actually invest in themselves and follow through with their commitments. You know, what, what advice would you pass to them to kind of get over that little hump? Like, all right, I, it's okay to do this because I'm, it's for the right reasons. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it if it's for the right reasons. So if you can point to the value that the whole family receives by you uh, investing in that particular way, then that's kind of a brainer. You know, everybody wins. So it's not so much a selfish thing. It's sort of a mission thing. This is what I need to do in order for us to continue moving in the right direction as a unit. So, you know, as long as you can make that clear, there usually is not much of an issue. You know, and I would also going back to what to take what you just said and balance it off what Drew said. When you do that thing and it shows that you're committed to it, you know, she will respect you more, even though you're doing the thing that she might not want you to do because she sees that mm -hmm. you are someone who is driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And those. Uh, who are complaining that their wives give them a hard time. Uh, maybe their wives are just losers. They need to go and find something for themselves. Why don't they go to the gym? Why don't they get some friends? Why don't they uh, in, it, it take up some creative pursuit of their own? If they're constantly nagging. That means that they are, they're living vicariously through the man. And when that happens, there's animosity also too. Because uh, to live vicariously to, through someone is to have resentment towards them. And so there's jealousy. So, you know, maybe encourage her to get off her butt and to gain and, and maybe have her own hobbies and interests and friends, you know? One of the things I noticed with my wife, and you guys in the chat, let me know if this uh, volume or if this uh, game ever got any better. But, uh, you know, my wife gave me a lot of shit. At one point, I started a, uh, a small side business building guitar amps. And I was out in the, in the garage and stuff a lot. And um, that that helped quite a bit uh, to, to get my own head together, do things that really made me happy. And she used to kind of complain about it and bitch about it and I'm really happy about it. And then all of a sudden, she, you know, I'm starting to really do well. And she's bragging about it. You know, and that's that's the thing. I mean, she gets proud of what I do. I mean, she she used to give me shit for coming down here, and, you know, the, the red man groups on Saturday morning and stuff. You know, there's like three hours and shit. She's like, how you know, how can you you know devote that kind of time? I'm like, it's important. And as she's watched it progress over the last couple of years, 
she realizes that, yeah, it is important. And she's proud of me. She brags about me now all the time. So um, things that used to piss her off now, you know, now she's proud of. So just keep keep focusing on your mission. Like you said earlier, you got to have a freaking mission. Otherwise, your life's going to be boring. You're going to be you know, putting a gun in your mouth. You know? Well, there's an element of mystery to it as well. I think, you know, when, when women don't know everything about you, you, you remain someone who is interesting to them. They don't know everything you're going to do. <clears throat> they don't know everything that you're thinking, every action you're going to take, you know, out of nowhere, you're starting a side business, you know, out of nowhere, you're, you're going to, you know, work with the musicians out of nowhere, you're going to do a, a new strength camp. You know, we all are building these things that we're kind of just doing them. And it's, you don't know what we're going to do next. You know, whether it's a new YouTube show, whether it's a new convention, you have no idea. And when we look at high value men, that's what they do. They're always on the move. They're always a changing shape. You can never put them into a mold because they're doing something new the next you know, minute. So when we talk about high value, it's not just you know your sexual market value. There's also the intangibles, which is you don't see if a man is going to be like a, an amoeba. You can't see that. It just happens. He just makes a different decision than what she expected. And a part of that is you know when you're asking for permission, you're saying, here's what I want to do. Will you let me? She's not confused. There, there's nothing mysterious about that. You're telling her what you're going to do. Or when you say, hey, I just did this thing. She's like, what the hell? Look, like, why did you do that? How did you, what the, so many questions. She's like, I never thought you would do that thing. Wow, you did it and you pulled it off and it worked. You know, and I think there, that's an, also an element of attraction is that you're mysterious. She can't put you with her thumb on you. Mm -hmm. And set the tone with that real early. My wife to this day still doesn't know what I'm going to do next. I'm still surprising her. And we've been dating since we were 14 years old. The only thing that she's not surprised about is that she's going to be surprised. <laughs> she knows that. But like uh, the other day when I shaved my head, I just shaved my head. You know, I've had all kind of crazy hairstyles. And she said, uh, uh, how shocking in a sarcastic way that Elliot Hulse does something shocking. So that's the thing. Keep her on her toes. Is the only the only constant is the inconsistency. <laughs> yeah, I'll con constantly be inconsistent. <laughs> Dig it. Surprise. <laughs> Got him. So <laughs> that was good. I didn't even notice that no. you shaved your head, man. <laughs> no, the, uh, the issue we talked about this the other day uh, offline, but I mean, there's this issue now. I got shit friends here in town where I live. I mean, I don't, even, I don't consider them to be anything more than, than good acquaintances that I might see once in once in a while. And uh, I mean, I, these guys are all doing the same thing. They're asking permission of their wives to do this, that, and the other. And, and it's it's so bad to be around that I, I've just removed myself from the situation. It's difficult to sell. Now, one of the things that uh, we did after the 2018 convention is uh, get a couple guys together locally in Orlando and specifically set aside days each month that we get together. This is time that's for this Orlando tribe to get together just the guys. And mostly it's just been meeting, you know, for you know, drinks, coffee, and talking about this, this exact sort of thing. Um, almost like a uh, I wouldn't say a mini convention, but talking with and trying to throw ropes out to, you know light torches for other men. And I think, I think men in general need something like that, need to do that. But if you got guys who feel they can't go anywhere, can't do anything unless they ask permission, throw them a rope. You know, I think they need to tell these guys, Hey, listen, you know, this is not good for you. This is, you need to, you need to, Think about who it was that you were before you got married and what it was that you liked about yourself and what you liked to do. Why did you give that up? Take it back. Did you like to go shooting? Did you go camping, canoeing, hiking, uh, playing sports, whatever? Start it again. And if, you, if you're not in the shape to, if you don't have the gear or whatever, make it part of your mission to get back to the point where you're doing those things. Find other men that are interested in the same things, get together with them on a regular basis and do that. Um, I we, we get together every other Tuesday. And a lot of it actually has been talking with some other guys that have recently joined and trying to, to either red pill them or if they are already sort of red pill, helping them work out specific issues. And I would I would strongly recommend it. If if you if you find that you you know, spend most of your time sitting home with the wife or the kids and you don't have anything outside of that, 
you know, look up other people that are you know, in the forums or that are, you know, coming into the chats in some of these videos and or, or set up a meetup or something and start getting together with other men in your area and helping, well, helping everybody get back to where they need to be in terms of they're making themselves their mental point of origin, defining their mission and starting to work towards that. So you, you answered a question I didn't ask. <laughs> the next thing I was going to say is how do men develop this? But I mean, that's perfect. That was the all encompassing answer of how do you develop this from if you're in a position where, you know, you've not done this in years. Yep. With the help of other men. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think I think men locally have got to look around, uh, especially if you're home all the time. I travel extensively for work, so I'm hooking up with guys all the time. When I'm in, a, a, you know, some I go to Atlanta or whatever, I'll find some guy that's in the fraternity or somebody I know on Twitter or whatever. We go out and have a beer, that kind of thing, and that keeps me going because those are like-minded men. Um, if you're like like you said, if you're local all the time, I'm in a small town, man. There ain't a whole hell of a lot of like-minded men here. I'm in a college town, for God's sakes. So um, it's, it's a challenge, man. I don't know how guys do it. I mean, where do you find, where do you find like-minded men at the gym? I mean, you may only see them from what, 5.30 to 7 at night and they're going back to their families. They're going out to do their thing. And, you know, you just have to fight for it, I guess. But I, I don't know where they are because I haven't found them. They, they're, they're, they're not at church. They're at the 21 convention. <laughs> Damn straight. <sorry. laughs> Link below. <laughs> so... There's something that I've noticed, uh, I've noticed in my life, uh, other men have brought it to me as well, and that's the disappointment of self-improvement. And this kind of goes back to something that El Elliot brought up, which is when you start improving yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, you start taking on these hobbies, you start developing yourself as a man, you expect others to do the same. You, it's kind of like a covert contract. You're like, well, by doing this, they're going to get better too. So what do you do when you're starting to improve, but your friends aren't? Your wife isn't, you know, your family isn't, and resentment starts to build. What do you do to to kind of combat that that issue that they don't even know that you're mad at them, but you're like, come on, I'm feeling great, and I want everybody to feel like this, and I've got a hobby, and I want you to have a hobby, and let's go out and do something. You know, how how do you combat the the issue that will develop because you're going to start moving, and you're going to realize they they're no longer fuel or peers; they're an anchor that's holding you back from going even further. Uh, you can't force them. You know, the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, can't force it to drink. I think the best thing that you can do is lead by example. Show them how pursuing your own mission and in the pursuit of that, constantly working to be better yourself is making you happier and also how it indirectly benefits them. And let them know, hey, if you want to go out, you know, if your wife was, I don't know, I don't know my wife likes to crochet. So I buy her a bunch of yarn and all stuff. It's great that she's doing something that she enjoys. I mean, actually, she makes a bunch of stuff and we donate it to uh, Humane Society for the pets, for the little pet photos, for the adoption stuff. <clears throat> Tell them, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, you know, support them in it, um, encourage them. But, you know, just I, I think more than anything, just leading from the front. But if you have some people that just won't, there, I worked with a guy for a while named Mark Merrow. If any of you were WWE fans, you might remember him as Johnny B. Bad or the marvelous <laughs> Mark Merrow. And he does a lot of motivational speaking now. You're laughing, so I think you might remember the character because it was kind of a, a goofy character that he played. But um, he had this saying, and it's corny, but it sticks with me, is that people are like elevators. You know, They can either take you up or they can take you down, and you should not be spending time with or investing in people who only take you down. If if they want, you know, you're on your mission, you're moving forward, you let them know that, hey, I will help you, I will support you in this, but you've got to get on and move forward with me. If you're not, or even worse, if you're going to try to slow me down, you're going to get left behind. So lead by example, offer support and encouragement, but know when that you when you've got to drop somebody who's dead weight that just refuses to do what's necessary to to do the work to improve themselves, and sometimes it takes them getting to a really bad place before they're well if if they're willing to to turn around and start doing what it takes to improve themselves. But until they do, you can't let somebody else get in the way of your mission or negatively affect your pursuit of being the best that you can be. 
I think that that's a lesson I've recently learned. You know, it was actually AJ Cortez who taught me that it's okay to use the block button. So on Twitter, I would never block somebody because I'm like, I'm better than that. I don't need to block them. I can handle haters and criticism and all these things. He's like, look, and like Eric said in the chat, you know, he's like, why, why waste your energy though? Like you have nothing to prove to these people. And I was like, holy crap, man. Like there was like a, like, you know, the mind bomb went off, but I saw that and I realized in my real world as well, you know, how many people were, was I allowing to take that energy from me? Or was I trying to like will them to do better? And it's like, okay, I can nothing you, you know what? I'll be here when you're ready, but I'm not going to keep going to you. You know, I'm going to keep spending the energy reaching out. Like you come to me when you're ready. It's no longer my job to bring you with me. I've got myself. I've got my family. I'm bringing us where I want to go. You can join whenever you want. The, the, the hand is there, but I'm not reaching it out to you. It's just there to pull you up. You've got to climb, you know, it's like the throwing ropes concept. We can throw ropes to these men, but we can't make them climb out of the hole that they're stuck in. The way that I like to look at that with blocking on social media is you have a limited amount of time and you have a limited amount of energy. And when you are on a mission and you have people that are reaching out to you to help or people that, you know, are sincerely trying to improve themselves those are the people who deserve your time and every minute that you spend responding to some asshole some troll somebody who's just trying to to rile you up is a minute that you're not helping somebody who is trying to be better and deserves your time so i block if somebody's somebody's an ass if somebody is getting in the way of my mission which again is to help people be healthier i block them because that gives me more time to help the people that deserve it. So you know, I threw in the I threw in the chat, you know, if they had any questions. So as you got as you gentlemen go and you know discuss, once they start throwing them out, I'll throw them to you guys. What are you gonna say, Tex? I was just gonna say, I mean, we're talking about self-improvement and all that and the people around us. Um, you know, your wife's either gonna see this as dread and she's gonna try to improve her game, or she's not. You know, so the men out there that are trying to improve, it's going to go one way or the other. She's going to try to improve where she's not going to improve. And I, I talk to guys all the time, and it seems like after a certain period of time, their improvement continues to get better, and their wife continues to get worse, more apathetic, more fat, or whatever. And that's, unfortunately for a lot of guys, that's when they, they end up cutting the cord. It's, we're done. You know, they just, they're, they're not seeing anything. Hopefully they give it enough time to be, you know, careful about that. But then there's family members too that, that are, are toxic. At the end of the day, you gotta you gotta cut loose of those guys as well. So, it's tough. All right, we've got a question: How to improve mindset from scarcity to abundance? So this is a question that it comes up almost every red man group. How do you go from scarcity to abundance? How do you make yourself you know want to go out and do more things and not be so worried? Well, I'll give you my answer. You gents can tackle it as well. But you just go out and do the thing. If you're afraid of losing that one girl, go out and talk to other girls. If you're afraid about losing that one friend, just go out and talk to other friends. You're an adult male, so I'm speaking to you as such. You've got to go out and do things. And that's how you start realizing you can do more things. You know, stop holding on to the one thing. It's like a puppy you love. You're going to squeeze it so tight it suffocates and dies. Don't kill the thing you love. Go out and love a lot of things. And you realize, hey, this is another thing I love, but it's just another thing. It's not the only thing for me. Anybody want to add to that? <laughs> Yeah, the Don't kill the puppy. mindset <laughs> is uh, scarcity is about fear, and to 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 live in fear means that you're not living in love, and you're going to be miserable even if you get the thing that you want. There's a lot of people who have a lot of stuff, but they live with the fear that it's going to be taken away. I need more insurance. I need to build a bigger fence. I need to hoard a little bit more. So you know, it's not about the uh the outward manifestation you know it's about the inward sentiment are you a man living out of fear or are you living out of your love nailed it i can't even add to that i totally agree so it's this it's not a question but i'm gonna bring it up anyway mcguire says a lot of men are losing incentive and sense of purpose Suicide rates are going up. A lot of guys I know haven't had sex in years. Men are becoming socially isolated. That's literally why we're doing what we do. That is why this channel exists. That is why the Family Alpha exists. That's why Elliot's putting content in the world, Drew, Text. That's why they're all putting things out there to let these guys know you aren't alone. 
I've gotten too many emails where men have said, you know, I didn't, I didn't suck start a Glock because I saw that I, you were putting out content that there were other people out there for me. Rational Mail, I can't even tell you how many emails Rolo's gotten, you know. But sometimes he shares and he lets you know that, like, hey, th they found his book or they found his blog and something made sense and they realized I'm not alone in this. You know, these men who feel isolated, we've got to build life banes that go to that island. We've got to have something that's going and feeding them some energy, letting them know, like, hey, maybe right now you're really good. And a lot of people watching this, maybe you're in a good spot. But when shit hits the fan, you're going to fall back and realize you're not alone because you watched the Patriarchs episode 10 with these gentlemen and myself. And you're like, well, at least I have those guys. I don't. I shouldn't kill myself because at least there are other men who are talking about this. It's not the end of the world. That's why we do what we do. It's kind of like planting a seed. It won't grow today, but it might grow when shit is the fan and when you hit rock bottom because rock bottom is a great fuel for that little seed to sprout and to grow and for you to choose you know, to live and breathe as opposed to just ending it. So, you know, so society right now is, is beating us down everywhere we look. I mean, whether it's social justice warriors doing their thing, whether it's the Democrats and Republicans, you know, attacking each other constantly all day long. You can't turn on the TV without seeing negativity everywhere. So, yeah, men are going to lose and lose a bit of sense of purpose because after a while, you're just like, damn, what's the use? What's the use? And you just go to work every day and you, and you work and probably work on a job you, you hate, you know, and, and I got I got good news for you. There's a lot of jobs right now. Unemployment rate is one of the all-time lows right now, and that's all over the country. So if you hate what you do, you know you're, you're going to have to have a little bit more of that uh, of that bonus mindset and say, okay, I can go do something else, and I can start to have more of a sense of purpose at work. I can have more, you know, you, then you're happier at home and everything kind of picks up. But uh, I mean, I, I took like a thirty, forty thousand dollar pay cut uh, to change jobs and get into, into a better industry years ago. And it was scary. My wife had to work a little extra harder. I had to work harder. At one point, it got so bad. I actually went. This is this is terrible. I went to fucking Domino's. I was gonna I was gonna deliver pizzas that night. And I stood I stood there and I put the fucking Domino shirt on. I looked in the mirror and I'm like, Nah, I gotta find something better than this. So if I could turn the nah. shirt off and walk down, man, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I'm just saying, you, you, you Make changes because if, if shit's bad now, it's just going to get worse tomorrow and the day after and a month later, you know, and I, I agree with what, what McGuire said. I mean, a lot of men are, they don't have a purpose in life. And that gets back to what Drew started this program with. You have to have some sort of mission, something going on. It can be as simple as I want to help my son become the best little league player I can. You know, it can, that can be your mission right now. That can be the summer's mission, you know, and work with what you got. And, uh, and find something that makes you happy. Go volunteer somewhere. Go do something outside the norm instead of sitting on the couch drinking a beer, you know, and watching Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. And I, I think his question actually contains part of the answer. He mentions here, men are becoming socially isolated. For, for the vast majority of human history, we were small tribes of hunter-gatherers, where from the time you were born, you were being cared for and taught and, and protected and provided for by the other men of the tribe. And as you got older, you worked with them and everybody depended on everybody else. And there was an interconnectedness. Nobody would have survived, or I shouldn't say nobody, but you didn't survive if you were not part of a tribe, if you did not have the other people around you. And with modern technology and you know, internet cell phones all this, you know telecommuting and all people are becoming more and more isolated and you don't see the same kind of well, men's gatherings or men getting together other than things that you know they maybe go to the bar and drink but a lot of it's just mindless battle i bartended for a while these men were not really connecting in any meaningful way. They were just trying to drown out their misery or escape from their boredom, or a lot of times escape from their, their wives and their miserable lives. And sporting events, they're sitting on the sidelines. It's a shared you know, activity, but they're not really doing anything together. They'd be better, men would be better off instead of going to watch sports to get involved with local you know, sports and compete. And that actually give them not just a sense of belonging to a group and what, everything that comes with that, but another reason to try to improve themselves. But again, I think, again, if the problem is social isolation, the solution to that is seek out other like-minded men and don't isolate yourself. 
try to get together with people on a regular basis. Find other people of like mind or find other people that are searching for answers. Find guys that are where you were a year or two ago trying to be better and throw them ropes. That sounds good, but where, where, Drew, where do you find them? That's the thing. That's what guys are asking. Where do I find these guys? That's the thing. Where? You know, that's what we're up against. Well, we've got the internet. We've got Twitter. I, I, Hunter and I have fraternity of excellence that we hang out in. That We have, we have a 21 group, 21 conference, and we've got Redman group. We've got things here, right? But how does the average guy in Cincinnati go out and find some dudes to hang with? That's that's the issue, you know? That is a, that is a good question. That's, I, I, mean, I don't I have an answer either, that. man. I mean, we, we got to figure this shit out, and I don't know where to do it. It's not a church. I mean, I Maybe you volunteer. Maybe you could decide, okay, I'm going to become an, um, a, f- a football official. I love football. I'm going to go learn how to, how to ref junior high football or something. You know, maybe you're going to be around more coaches who are generally more manly men. Maybe you're going to start finding those guys there. Maybe you go join the Brazilian jiu-jitsu thing. Maybe you go do something like that where you're going to be around more guys. But honest to God, man, I, I, I struggle with that here, and I've been dealing with that all my life. So we just got a super chat. $20 from Porter Hodges. He asks, any thoughts on having children while in your 40s and 50s? It's hard to imagine being 60 with a 10-year-old. Thank you, man. <laughs> so I'll jump on this real quick because I'm the least qualified to talk on it. <laughs> I had my son at 22 and my daughter at 25. I am 32 now. They are nine and six. My thoughts, and this is a decision I made early on, was I wanted to be a young parent. I wanted to go right after real quick. I knew I wanted to be a dad, so I made it happen. When it comes to having them older, I understand that men make that decision. They want to be financially secure, professionally secure. They want everything to be secured. To me, you can't. There's never a right time to have kids. You know, you just know when it's time for you to have kids. So when you you're like, all right, I've got the girl I want. I've got the house I want. You know, maybe I don't have enough money. Go for it. You know, my first TV stand was an upside down Tupperware container that I put like a sheet over, and we put a tiny like 32 inch TV on it, and that was us living large. You know, like there's never a the perfect time for it, but you know. If you want to be a dad and you've got the girl and you vet and you want to have the kid, do, do it. I mean, go for it. Now, to have it in your 50s and 60s, you know, I, I, I can't answer that. I've not done that, you know. It Touch your grandkids, man. Could you imagine the okay. your kids? No, no, I absolutely fucking not. Um, but I had my son when I was, my last kid when I was 30. I'm uh, not 30, 28, 27, somewhere in there. And I, I felt like I waited late. Um, I think the thing is, is that if you are 40 or 50 and you have no kids and you want kids, then go get kids, go make kids, go find you a younger woman. I hate to say this, but women that are in their 40s shouldn't be having babies. You get more Down syndrome, you get more all kinds of things that are that are not cool. And it's birth defects because what happens, the body's DNA breaks down as we get older. That's why we age. And the DNA from, and honestly, you're 40 or 50, your DNA that you're contributing is not going to be the ultimate either. That's why having babies early on in life is a smart thing to do. But if you want kids, find a younger woman and go have kids. Just know that, yeah, you're going to be uh, you know, 60 or 70 at the high school graduation, you know, and you're not going to maybe be able to get out there and play football with them, you know. But here's the good news. If you're in decent shape and you've kept yourself in decent shape for 40, 50, you can get out there and play football with them. So don't be scared about that. Just don't be a fat ass. Yeah. That's that. I <laughs> actually know one person who had a kid, and I think he was in his 60s when he had him. I think he's 70 something now and his kid is in his teens but this was l darden uh, who was the director of uh research for nautilus sports medical industries back in the 70s and 80s was a competitive bodybuilder in the 60s and even in his 60s and even now that he's 70s he's in better shape than most 20 year olds and his wife was a whole lot younger so he seems to be doing fine but to be able to do that at the age that he was and is now you would have to keep yourself in exceptional physical condition just to be able to keep up with the kid and not be, well, not be more like their great grandparent sitting on the couch, sitting on the sidelines and not being an active physical participant in the activities that they want to do. Elliot, how old are your kids? Well, I started having children when I was 23 as well. You know, yeah, buddy. <laughs> we're pretty young, <laughs> me and Hunter. So, I mean, my oldest is, uh, is, is 14. And I'm I just turned 40. So I started early and uh and I'm I'm happy because I'm gonna be done when this guy's getting started. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sorry yeah, for you. Yeah, we if you have a kid at 50, you're talking about high school graduation. You're 68 years old while they're walking across that stage, man. That's mm -hmm. that's nuts. And I, mean, I get we're living longer. I fully get it. I get it. We're right. living longer. You know, we're, we're more health aware. You know, all these things. I, I understand it. It just to me that that's not the call. You know, that was just right. that never crossed my mind. Happiest day you're going to have is when you get that last kid off your meal plan. My yeah. kid's out the door and fending for themselves and then they got a job and all that stuff. I'm telling you, the best part of all this stuff, I'm telling you, being 57 and having three grandkids, 10, 8, and 5, are is awesome because, I mean, I'm getting to hang out and do, do fun stuff with them when I'm still able to be, you know, out and having, having a great time. So the ultimate reward for having those kids early is getting grandkids early. I promise you. Uh, I was going to say, the, the thing that I would be most concerned about with having kids later in life is that it shortchanges you and them. You don't get to have as many years. I mean, it's better than nothing, but you don't get to have as many years with your children. Don't get to pass on as much to them if you start later, and they lose you earlier. So it's definitely better to start early. I'd, I'd say, you know, obviously you want to be in a good place in your life before you, you know, get married and, and have kids. But for most men, you know, late twenties, maybe the early thirties or so, depending on how quickly you can get your shit together is probably ideal. You know, somebody brought up that 40 year olds are becoming the 40 year old women, you know, being the new mothers and that's the age that they should have them and they're praised for it. And then he says why a man should have a problem with it. So I don't think they're understanding the writing on the wall, which right. you're basically telling a woman that, all right, go ahead and party and do everything you want and you can settle down later. You know, let's just keep kicking that can down the road. Listen, mm -hmm. you, you, they can promote that all they want. And the guys, you know, Deppy Zizuri, because I like to, you know, name drop exactly who I'm talking to. So you ask the question, nobody's saying men can't do it. Nobody's saying that men should not do it. I, I literally prefaced my statement with you do what you got to do. You're a grown man. And I'm going to speak to you accordingly. I'm speaking to you like a man. You make the decision when you reproduce, but I'm just saying, that's not my call. Elliot did not make that call. Tex is talking about his call. Drew said his answer as well. We're, we're telling you our perspective. If you have a different one, go ahead and keep it and go forward. Let me know how it works out for you. I hope you do well. But you know, when you're saying, oh, well, women are getting praised and men aren't. No, men can do whatever the hell they want. That's what the beauty of being a man. And women, I'm not marrying a 40-year-old woman and having a kid with her. That's not going to happen. And Tex just said, if you're going to have a child as an older man, you want a young, fertile woman who yep. can be young and fresh and energized to raise those kids. Yeah, so no rotten eggs. The only people cheering on 40-year-old moms is like older 40 year old moms, 40 -year -old moms. <laughs> that's the only right. people that are praising them <laughs> nobody else is they're in denial of the wall that they are either face first into already or are very close to so i think there's just two, two things two guys here younger guys that are saying hey man should i wait till later in life my i think everybody here says no don't but guys that are, that are, you know, 38, 39, 45, that still want to have kids, don't give up on that. Because if you really want kids to have them, I wish I had more. I, I shut it down too quick. I only had two. Should have had more. I screwed that up looking back at it. So um, <laughs> if you want, want them to have them, you can never afford them. People say, oh, I can't have more kids because I can't afford them. Guess what? You couldn't afford one. So just have them. You'll figure it out. All right. I'm going to go with our final question. We'll follow it up with the final topic and we'll wrap this one up. So the last question, I want each of you to give it because I don't think there's a better group of men to, to give this because we have an array of kids ages as well as <clears throat> personal hobbies and pursuits we're chasing. So the final question is, my son is three years old. If I'm not at my day job, I have my son and my time is strapped. I gave up hobbies and my side hustle to make sure he is cared for. How do you balance out kids and care for your own pursuit of excellence. How do you balance fatherhood with pursuit of self-development and growth? So Drew, I'd like to start with you. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive or even competitive. I think if you have a young child, unless you're taking them on a construction site or, or uh, into you know, a dangerous environment, there's no reason that they can't be with you while you are working towards whatever your goals are. In fact, doing so shows them, you know, what is involved in doing that. Yeah, I've, for, for most of the, well, 
maybe the past five years or so, I transitioned from training people in a private studio to training people at, well, you can't see, I'm pointing at equipment that's off camera, training people at home so I could spend more time with my wife, so I could spend more time with my son instead of being at the gym 12 to 15 hours a day. And so my son is around here. He sees what I'm doing and I can interact with him. I can put him through some workouts. Um, when he was younger, and I regret this. Well, you guys know, well, maybe Elliot knows what this is like. If you're training people, everybody wants to work out super early in the morning or after they're done with work. So you get appointments all day long. I regret not, not having done this sooner, but uh, you can find ways to involve your kids in that while also still making time to do the kind of things that they might have an interest in or doing things that are good for their development. I think you find ways, find ways to combine it. Elliot, you've got quite a bit in your plate. How do you balance fatherhood, being a husband, being a patriarch with all the things that you're doing? Well, you know, I'm going to refer to the question uh, about having the three-year-old and, you know, spending all that time with him. I don't think that, especially boys, but I don't think children in general really even need their dad that much at that age, to be completely honest. They're still under the major care of their mother. And I remember, you know, I really was not around that much. I made myself available because I wanted to be, but it it's not until they get, you know, eight, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old that they even know, <laughs> quite frankly, that they even notice that you're there. You know, I think uh, this is a situation of single fatherhood. Oh, uh, that's a little I, different. so the way I read it, that's how I read it because I agree with you. And that was my initial response. So yeah. now for a single dad, same answer. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know if I'm <laughs> changes things. <laughs> I don't know if I'm qualified to answer, you know, <laughs> as far as a, a single dad is concerned. Um, but again, still, it, you, you know, do the best that you can to. I, it's hard for me to answer that because a part of my answer was what's more important is how their mother responds to you during those early ages, you know, because the way the mother is towards the father is, is the energy and the nature that the children are going to take on towards the father so, because they're the mother's the first, you know? So if you're dealing with a, uh, a, a single, if you're a single father, I, <sighs> I think it would be important to get on the same page with the mother and make sure she's not bad talking you and shit like when you're not around. And then when you're together, I'm sorry, I wish I had more to offer, but it's probably not until he's about seven years old that it's even, you can even like really even do anything that's going to, that's going to impact his consciousness. You know, right now you're, you're basically still just uh, giving him bottles and changing diapers. Strict survival. Just basic yeah. instinct stuff. Yeah. I, I can speak from the other side of this because um, I was the kid and my sister and brothers whose dad took us when he was doing a lot of his work and his activities. My parents split when I was about eight and I had a sister that was six, a brother that was four, another brother that was two. And my dad was a school teacher, but he also coached football and he coached basketball. And I think for a while he was also coaching track and field in the spring. And then during the summers, he was working at the state park and he would bring us along. We would be at football practices. We would be at basketball and I'd watch my sister and brothers and we could sit and play with, you know, play with the basketballs, play the footballs, you know, run around in the track, play on the big mats for the uh, pole vault. And then, you know, go and follow him around doing stuff at, uh, it was High Cliff State Park up in Wisconsin. And I actually have very fond memories of that. And he, obviously he had to do his job. He had to coach. He had to be focused on what he was doing at the time. But there was also, you know, some attention and just the fact that he wanted to have us along and do that because he didn't have to. We could have stayed home with uh, our mom but he wanted to have us as often as possible. And sometimes that meant bringing us along when he was doing these other things. So he still did the things that he enjoyed that were important to him. And coaching was a, a big part. He coached, well, he eventually stopped with the basketball and the other stuff, but he coached football for over 30 years before retiring from that. Worked for the state parks for a long period of time. And I, I look back very fondly on that. Again, I was eight when this was happening, but I don't, 
see any of that as a negative, having been there with him and seeing him and the way that he interacted with a lot of these other kids as well um, would be better than just being stuck at home with mom, sitting in front of the TV or not, nothing against mom, but he, he made it work. And I think a single father could do this. Again, my youngest brother was two at the time. Um, I don't know how much he remembers. We don't talk about it that much, but I do remember having fun with my sister and brothers when we were there at the basketball practices, you know, out throwing the football and, you know, trying not to, you know, let my little brother run off and get into the, the middle of scrimmages and stuff. But uh, it, it worked. My dad made it work. I think other men could make it work too. So he responded, you know, saying he's divorced, single dad, and he has his boy a lot. So listen, I, I think you need to bring your hobbies back. I think you need to bring whatever passion is that you had back. And I think you need to bring whatever that side hustle was back. It, it's difficult to talk about this topic without sounding like you're washing your own balls. But when you look at it, you know, you just become really good at time management. When I started TFA, I had kids. You know, when I started doing YouTube, I had kids. When I was driving home from work, I would make videos. And then when I got home, I would play basketball or baseball with them. And then we'd go to practice. And then on the way back, I'd shove something in my face. I'd see the wife. We'd hang out. I'd read with the kids. They'd be done. I'd go and record a video. I'd go write a blog post. I'd go in and hang out with the wife. She'd go to bed. I'd go write a blog post. And that was my life. And there was no minutes. You lose a lot of sleep, but you get very good at maintaining energy. You don't get to sit down and say, I'm tired. The videos don't record themselves. The business doesn't run itself. You make all of that happen. And you can do that while being a present and active father. I coach my kids' baseball team. We constantly are at the field. But guess what? I'm here right now, aren't I? The same thing is what you have to do. You've got to make yourself a priority. There are times you got to draw the line and say, I'm not just a dad. I'm also a man building something. You don't have your kid 24-7. Your child is not awake 24-7. There's no reason for you to justify your mediocrity in pursuing those points of excellence in your life by saying, I've got a three-year-old. Kids are busy, man. They're going to keep you busy. And this is for all fathers. Your children are a huge part of your life. They need your presence with a CE at the end, not TS. They need you involved setting an example. And you're setting a poor example if you're going to put everybody else in front of you because you're trying to self-sacrifice your way to happiness. You can't put everybody else first in front of you and expect you to cross the finish line. Everybody's going to leave you behind. You're of no value because you've done nothing. Your kid's going to be 15 or 13, 10 years from now, and you'll have no hobbies. You've built no side hustle. You've done nothing for yourself except raise that kid. You cannot live vicariously through your kid, and your child is not your purpose in life. Yeah, let me, let me add. I, I just look at this from the outside because um, I've seen this lately. Three-year-old kids are a chore. you got to keep after them. they got to take naps. You gotta, you, they're, they're needy little things, and that's okay. That's, that, that's their right. As they get older, it gets easier. But at the end of the day, you're divorced. You know, I guarantee you, your wife is keeping them some days. You know, you're working. I mean, you get up early, early, half an hour, 45 minutes early and go work out before you go to work. I mean, there's there's things you can do. Uh, don't let it be an excuse. Don't let it be an anchor. Uh, enjoy these the three-year-old because, man, they, they're, they're going to grow up and you're going to look back and you're going to say, God, dog, I should sure enjoy those years. You know, stupid stuff that you did. You know, do things together and take them fishing and just do things that you can do with a three-year-old. And obviously it's limited right now, but as they're five and they're six, those things that you're going to do with them are going to build on each other. And you're, you're going to be building something in your garage. You're going to decide you want to build a, a stupid bench or something for the front yard. You know, your child, your son's going to be there with you the whole time, helping you measure, hold the plane, whatever it is. Um, these are years to enjoy and to build upon and not look at like, oh me, I can't do what I want to do. Well, yeah, you can, you can still work some stuff in. Hunter just nailed it. Uh, but enjoy these years while you've got them. Cause you don't have your son seven days a week. I'm betting. So the days you do have it, maximize it. I got a good friend in Chicago. He only gets his son on weekends every other weekend. Those weekends are devoted to his son, you know, and he, and he, and he but you know, the other 13 days, 12 days, he's out living the life. So, I mean, I'm just saying that there's ways of doing this. All right. We've answered a lot of questions. We've had great discussion. I want to wrap this one up with a, a quick question and maybe a one to three sentence answer from each of you, which is, and again, because I'm a practical man, I don't want to go too deep into theory. I want to go no shit to the praxology of how do we apply this to our lives. So starting with Drew, because you're my bottom left and you're just going to go down the line. 
What is the best action a man can take to create his new self where he is a priority and he is maintaining himself or he's creating himself to become a high value man? I think you need to think about what is important to you in life and make a mission out of it. Something that is bigger than yourself and something that requires you to work towards continuous improvement. And it can be, you know, some people mentioned earlier, you know, working towards some sort of a charity, or it can be to build something that lasts beyond you, uh, to help other people in some way. But uh, to be able to help other people, I don't want to go off on, on too long, but basically build, have a mission, have a clearly defined mission that involves something that is bigger than you and that also requires you to continuously try to be better. Excellent. Elliot, what's the best action a man can take to remain or become a man of high value? Stop consuming. Start fasting. That is the best way to detach from the feminized society, the society of overconsumption and attachment to materialism, and move towards your true nature, the pattern within. And at the same time, you're going to be putting yourself first. You're going to be getting healthier and you are setting an example and letting people know that I have discipline, commitment, resolve, steadfastness, and whatever I put my mind to, I can do. And it's something that most people aren't willing to even try. Tex, you want to close it up? I do. Um, own your shit. Everybody here has got shit. They tell, tell you all these different things you can do to improve yourself. But uh, look in the mirror, take stock of all the things that you have fucked up in your life and all the things you're continuing to fuck up in your life and start fixing those things. And I don't care what it is, but just start owning your own stuff, okay? And admitting to yourself that, you know, you, you've got things to work on. You, they'll become glaringly obvious. You know, pick the... Uh, Pick the one that's, that's, that's bothering you the most and start working on it. It could be anything, but you know what they are. I don't. So fix it. And I've been thinking on the problem that we discussed earlier of how to find and get together with men of like mind locally. And, you know, I talked about how social media is kind of part of the problem with, with isolation. I think it may actually be the best tool you can leverage to do this. You can set up like a meetup.com group. You could set up a group on Facebook. You can set up, I don't know what else there, there's Gab and some others, but use this as a way to find and connect with other men and set up real world meetings. Go out shooting together, you know, put together a team and go play softball. Uh, football, whatever it is that you want to do, get together and just talk about these issues and try to help pass the stuff that you're getting, you know, from the Red Man Group and Fraternity of Excellence and 21 Con and all that. Throw this stuff out there, get it into other men's hands, try to help them. But social media might be the best way to find and start organizing real world meetings. All right. This has been episode 10, the final episode before we take this thing live. In a little over two weeks, all these patriarchs are coming together. Anthony Johnson built the greatest event for fathers and it's by fathers. If you enjoy the show, seeing it live, eating those meals together, shaking hands, looking each other eye to eye, you know, that, that's what it's all about. That's how you break that electronic barrier. So Drew is just talking about using social media to your advantage. Stop going online and wasting time consuming. Go produce something. Like Elliot just said, produce. Don't just sit there as consuming all this content. Don't be a well-read man. Go out and do things. Hey, I want to meet up. Go and meet up. Go and do something together. Go shoot. Go lift. Go climb. Go run. Go hike. Go do whatever it is you want to do as a man, as a patriarch. That's how you sharpen yourself. You make yourself strong because you're running with lions. You see that your friends are getting better, so you want to get better. You know, the electronic barrier, it brings you closer to people. It doesn't have to be something that drains you. It could be something that charges you. That's the whole point of doing these red man groups. They're, they're designed and the way we run them is so that they educate you to go forward and to apply it to your life so you're better off because of it. In a little over two weeks, we're coming together. 
If you want to join us, the links are below. We've already advertised it ad nauseum to everyone. So nobody can say, I didn't know it was happening. You know what's happening. If you want to join us, do so. Click the link, buy the ticket, join us up top. We'll high five. It'll be awesome. Till then, gentlemen, it's been great. Thanks for having me, buddy.